Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Slasher Study Summer Camp, uh, an international conference on slasher theory, history, and practice. Uh, I'm Wickham Clayton. I'm a lecturer in film production at the University for the Creative Arts in Farnham. And my name's Daniel Shepard, and I'm visiting lecturer in film studies, as well as PhD candidate at Birmingham City University, UK. So we'd originally pitched this conference as a one-day symposium, but with such immense and overwhelming support from peers and colleagues, here we are kicking off what promises to be a rich, innovative, and essential three-day conference dedicated to the um, dedicated to the study of the slasher subgenre. Indeed, this is the first of its kind. Um, before I, I hand uh, back over to Wickham, who's going to set some of the theoretical foundations for this conference, which will then be followed by our closing roundtable discussion with Professor Joan Hawkins, Dr. Steve Jones, and Dr. Murray Leader on Sunday at 9 p.m. BST. We just have a couple of housekeeping notices. So firstly, to thank our invited speakers who have been incredibly gracious and generous with their time, namely Professor Vera Dika, Dr. Steve Jones, Troma Entertainment, Lloyd Kaufman, costume designer Ellen Lutter, and cinematographer John Newby, ASC, we've set up a PayPal money pool in which we invite you to make a donation. Donations are in lieu of paying the usual conference registration fees, allowing us to make this conference as accessible as possible, and the total raise will be distributed between our keynote and industry speakers. Donations are, of course, totally optional, but we are great. We will gratefully receive um, anything, no matter how big or small. Details will be posted in the YouTube comment section um, at intervals throughout the next three days. Um, a big thank you to those who've kindly donated already, as well as to those who retweeted our announcement yesterday on Twitter. Um, speaking of Twitter, we'll be actively engaged throughout the next three days. So for those of you on the platform, do follow us using the handle at Slasher Studies. Um, while we hope to live tweet as best as we can, there's only two of us. So we'd really appreciate it if you um, tagged us in any tweets using our handle at Slasher Studies. Um, and or if you use the hashtag, hashtag Slasher Studies, so that we can retweet and fully document proceedings. Finally, in addition to us connecting via the YouTube comment section, we've set up a server on Discord for those of you who are either on the platform or want to download the app for free. Discord allows us to stay connected during the conference intervals and have even more of a chilled engagement with one another. Details again will be posted in the YouTube comment section at intervals throughout the next three days. We're so thrilled. Uh, sorry, I'm making sure I'm uh, on. Yes, I am. Uh, we're, so, we're so thrilled uh, with and overwhelmed by the, the excitement and support we've received. Um, for, uh, as Daniel said, what we'd originally pitched as a one day symposium, um, the, the, the response and the fact that it extended into a three day uh, conference shows that slashers, um, a subgenre of horror with antecedent films and themes, dating firmly back to the 1960s and arguably to the origins of cinema. Uh, and the texts themselves uh, appearing in the late 70s and early 80s are texts of lasting cultural concern, social concern, uh, and aesthetic concern. So you've all come here to engage with these movies and to share your developing engagement. So by way of starting this conference, I'd like to briefly share a segment of something I've recently written. Um, it doesn't quite have a home yet, uh, and, and it's inspired by a book I'm currently editing uh, with Kara Shimabukuro, who I believe is, is attending uh, today. Um, what I'd like to do is build upon some comments I made in my introduction uh, to style and form in the Hollywood slasher film uh, to express some developing views that I have on the historical development of the slasher. Uh, particularly as it concerns approaches to aesthetics, but more precisely its relationship to cultural theory. So my argument uh, in, in that introduction was a bit of a wet noodle, uh, to be fair, which uh, aligned with my preference for analyzing form 
uh, but not fully prepared to condemn cultural studies uh, in line with the strong and potentially stubborn position of, of Stephen Booth, who's an entertaining and engaging and insightful scholar, but also a myopic one uh, who argues that the only thing cultural analyses of film texts can tell us about films is that they're the product of the culture within which they were made. So this is certainly one facet of cultural analyses and interpretations, but I think we can look at it from a slightly different angle as well. Um, we should argue or, or could argue uh, that film can tell us more than we perhaps already know about the culture in which they were made uh, and how films um, uh, and how films respond to uh, its own petri dish. Um, what follows is a bit of a diatribe on the way that horror films develop within the scope of historical, political, and social conditions, uh, and how these inform the way they are made and how we read them. And this is within a framework of how we look back at these uh, texts, particularly through remakes and reboots, um, but also as nostalgia pieces, uh, as these are films that have firm roots in the 1980s, um, with everything after in many ways responding and revising these initial concerns and forms. This also is more broadly about horror, um, but I feel as though slashers perhaps concentrate these points most keenly on the history. So we now look back at the 1980s as the 1980s look back at the 1950s. So the Cold War politics in the 1950s persisted along with a fond desire to return to a period of post-war prosperity following the socially tumultuous and economically unstable 60s and 70s. Uh, it's then no surprise that the war on terror was offered up as an alternative global narrative for the West in the 2000s to reinforce a range of Western nationalisms and Eastern, particularly Middle Eastern xenophobia. Of course, the 2000s or aughts or whatever you want to call it, most often saw a return to the franchises founded in the 1970s, which were established amidst the Vietnam conflict uh, and economic instability. Uh, as were echoed later in the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the housing crash in 2008. So these 1970s remakes, though, are frequently critiqued as having reductive formulaic narrations, constructions, and sociopolitical ideologies, in contrast to the largely anti-authoritarian, anti-patriarchal, American hegemony critical, structurally subversive originals, uh, if you read your Robin Wood, that is. Um, and if you're keeping track, this is about 10 years off the socioeconomic uh, and cultural alignment uh, for, you know, sort of thinking backwards, which suggests uh, a kind of a manufacturing of political and cultural narrative to reinforce a reactionary response in the populace of the nations with hegemonic power. But with the cultural industries and artists who perhaps conceive themselves as independent agents ideologically, uh, a one-to-one -one analog of manufactured intent uh, and resultant textual composition is rarely achieved. Um, the queerness of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, uh, which Darren Elliott Smith writes about, uh, the critique of class warfare and environmental destruction as fallout from the wielding of US military and nuclear power in the Hills Have Eyes remake, the erosion of patriarchal power and the toxicity of masculine potency and a furthering, uh, furthering queer gaze in, in uh, the Amityville horror with Ryan Reynolds in 2005, and the uprising of a, a product of the underclasses against its own horrors, as well as system, uh, systemic and institutional power and the oblivious middle classes and well, everything Rob Zombie's unilaterally, omnivorously misanthropic Halloween, um, all suggest that this targeted cultural reconstruction and rewriting of radical reifications into reactionary renderings resultantly can be ruled as not ideologically de rigueur. However, uh, the 1970s, which did give way to larger economic prosperity in the 1980s, uh, to the detriment of the poor who became poorer, uh, and political stability of the West in the 1990s, to the detriment of the second and third world countries who saw the colonial brunt of an increasing military surplus and the mining of resources, acceptance of waste products, and the exploitation of labor that comes with increased consumerism of more affluent Western population and industrialization and free trade laws. Whereas the war on terror in the 2000s was followed by a global economic crash, and in the 2010s, a very brief and all too small economic recovery, 
was accompanied by growing evidence of global meteorological catastrophes that come with climate change and increased awareness of widespread institutionalized and political misogyny and gender inequality, uh, particularly in the cultural industries and in the discourses over women's bodies, uh, the fighting of queer and sexual identities and bodies for equality and visibly against an overtly violently homo and transphobic culture public exposure of institutionalized racism, particularly when law enforcement, uh, which results in the targeting of black and indigenous people of color with physical violence, political disenfranchisement and socioeconomic destitution, further economic crashes, the overt rise of white nationalism, even worse results of climate change, a global pandemic, not to labor the point, but the period of prosperity was not forthcoming and the exploitation of the Western populace couldn't even accomplish it for the middle classes. Furthermore, with the rise of the internet and the information age, the actual experiences and abuses of the powerful against marginalized groups have been distributed and viewed by a larger number of people. This tends to happen when there is a greater access to the means of audiovisual production and distribution. So in periods of destabilization and uncertainty, horror tends to have a lot to say. Uh, and there are larger audiences for texts that reflect their own uncertainties and anxieties. Um, these texts also become more eloquent uh, in response to clearly labeled and identified sociopolitical and economic ills. So movies that aim for pure affect respond to contexts, be they environmental or aesthetic, and usually both are in play. So even films and paratexts that aim to look fondly on these foregone flicks and franchises for fans acknowledge their pastness and appreciate that memory sometimes needs activation uh, and a restructuring and reframing to encourage this nostalgic attachment. The idea that these are not just recreations, however, is not a new argument. It's fundamentally what Vera Dika argues in her book, Recycled Culture and Contemporary Art and Film. What I'm asserting here is that these horror films that specifically play on pastness, even presuming critics of the reactionary nature of Reaganite popular horror are completely right and are intrinsically reflecting and refracting the fact that those films are in the past and the now is much more terrifying. Furthermore, I, I'm arguing that the way we conceptualize analysis and wield our theory and methodologies are often rooted to this period. And to some extent, these theoretical arguments are beneficial, but with so much hindsight, this theory also needs to take into account our contemporary context. Wood, Dika, Creed, Williams, Clover, all have valuable contributions and hold as foundational sources of thought that we can still apply usefully. But these discourses develop, and the texts we are looking at are different beasts than the ones that we and they once knew. So limiting ourselves to the idea of a nostalgic text or something that is grounded in the past, we need development and refinement in our discourses to appropriately situate our understanding. In other words, we need to rethink the way we think to think about the rethinking of old movies. So if this doesn't fold us back in on ourselves and rather unfold things that we were already thought unfolded, uh, we can hope that all of these ideas tell us more about the stories that are told and the fears that we struggle with. I, we've long worked to come to terms with our beautiful and terrifying world. And the more history we create, the more we have to fear. And the exposure of the nastiness of this history we have, um, or we've made, means that we not only have new history to empty into these narrative receptacles, but we're also more aware of the horrors that may have gone hidden to us at the time. So the horrors of now, are hidden from many of us, which are, is terrifying considering how horrific now seems. And the way that we see now as horrifying is reflected in our now movies, but we'll later see now as past and what's hidden will then be seen or possibly reframed in some way. And then we'll have a context that now and even our past doesn't have, but then we'll also have its own hiddenness that later we'll see. And as all of this plays out uh, historically, horror will be there to help us make sense of it. You're on mute. I knew that was gonna happen at some point. It was just 
going to happen. It's also really great to see everybody engaging on YouTube through the comment section. So thank you so much for that, everybody. Um, without further ado, we're going to step straight into our first panel, uh, which is called um, Unearth Unearthing the Gothic Roots of Slasher. And for this, I am going to introduce our chair, Dr. Miranda Corcoran. So welcome, Miranda. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me and everything? Yeah. I'm very, I'm very paranoid about being on mute now. Oh, oh, there we go. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to assume that we are going with a fairly conventional um, panel structure. So what I'll do is I'll introduce each of our speakers in turn. Uh, they will present their papers and then we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end. And I assume questions are going to come in through the um, comment section on YouTube. Is that right? Yes. Okay, um, right, I'm gonna take that as being um, how I'm going to receive questions for this event. So, um, as Daniel said, this is our first panel of the day and it's called Unearthing the Gothic Roots of the Slasher. And our first presenter today is Dr. Catherine Lester who is presenting on The Girl in Final Girl, what children's films can tell us about the generic boundaries of slasher and female gothic cinema. And Dr. Catherine Lester is a lecturer in film and television at the University of Birmingham. Her monograph, Horror Films for Children, Fear and Pleasure in American Cinema, will be published in late 2021 by Bloomsbury. She continues to explore the intersection between children's culture and the horror genre with recent and ongoing projects, including a forthcoming edited collection on Watership Down for Bloomsbury's animation, Key Films Filmmaker Series, a chapter on children's television horror anthologies in global TV horror, and a chapter on intersections of villainy and gender in Disney's Frozen in discussing gender. So welcome, Catherine. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Miranda, and thank you, Daniel and Wickham, for hosting this excellent conference. So horror is typically thought of as a genre for adults and not suitable for children. And yet, horror made specifically for children is a category that exists um, and is thriving in a number of media, um, but especially film, which is my focus today. As Philippa Antunis argues, in her book, Children Beware, children's horror by its very nature calls into question the boundaries between categories, including boundaries between adulthood and childhood, between adult and children's content and boundaries between genres. And in my own work on this topic, especially in my forthcoming book, Horror Films for Children, I'm interested in the ways that children's horror films adapt and reshape particular horror subgenres to address a child audience and meet the adults defined content restrictions that are expected of children's cinema. In so doing, children's horror films can also prompt us to rethink the distinctions between certain horror subgenres. In this paper, I will argue specifically that children's horror films blur the distinctions between the slasher and the female gothic. These are two subgenres that have a striking amount of similarities, but I've been surprised to find in my own research that they are not generally thought about um, together in discussions of genre and horror specifically. As I've detailed elsewhere, Children's horror films negotiate content restrictions by toning down the typical markers of the horror genre, like intensity, disgust, gore and violence, and by filtering these elements through mitigating strategies like the use of comedy, animation and fantasy. Following Noel Carroll's definition of horror, in nearly all cases, the monster of children's horror films is supernatural. So children's horror films can come in a variety of horror subgenres that meet this criteria, like, as you can see on the screen, um, the vampire film, the haunted house film, the zombie film. But what about the slasher? <laughs> 
You would think that the slasher, with its classic iconography of a blade-wielding maniac, lots of blood, and sexually active teenaged victims, is simply too adult, and I say that, that word in big inverted commas, to be adapted to meet the content restrictions and expectations of children's cinema. But this hasn't stopped some children's horror films from including references to iconic slashes. This shot from Paranorman, for example, recreates a famous still from Halloween and simultaneously references the villain Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th franchise. On a deeper level, children's horror films and slashes also share a focus on young people who are under threat and are forced to defend themselves in the absence of help from reliable adult authorities. So clearly the slasher is about more than graphic violence. And indeed, Vera Dika argues in Games of Terror that the slasher or stalker as she calls it, is just as well defined by its character types, settings, plot structures and formal elements, especially the use of voyeurism and hierarchies of visual power. For Dika, slashes like Halloween stage a struggle for power between protagonist and antagonist for control of the film's visual field. In Halloween, this control is held first by Michael as conveyed through the use of voyeuristic point of view shots that keep him and his threat out of sight, but never out of mind. Eventually, of course, this control cedes to Laurie when she unmasks him and returns his gaze. Similarly, of course, Carol Clover also emphasizes the importance of vision in the slasher, especially through the use of point of view shots or the eye camera, as she terms it, um, to enact a complex system of viewer identification that shifts between the killer and the final girl. Owen Weech, more recently, has applied the methods of Clover and Dika to children's horror film The Hole in order to point out how that film's use of stereoscopic 3D replicates this struggle for visual control in three dimensions while excluding the violence for which the slasher is typically known. In The Hole, this struggle for power is gendered in that the victim is male and the villain is a supernatural entity that takes on the guise of his abusive father. Weech therefore argues that the whole's employment of the aesthetic language of the slasher renegotiates formal techniques popular in horror cinema to articulate a particular attitude towards violence. And this is an attitude that rejects the hegemonic associations between violence and masculinity. So I'm following Weech by applying Dika and Clover's frameworks to children's horror, but here I'm interested in what happens when we apply these frameworks to children's horror films where the protagonist is a girl, especially given that the slasher has been widely, though arguably unfairly regarded as a misogynistic subgenre. So theoretically, it's not just unsuitable for children, but also unsuitable for women. My case studies are Coraline, a 2009 stop motion animated film from the Laker studio, and The Watcher in the Woods, a Disney live action film from 1980. Both of these have female protagonists who for much of their respective films are stalked by an unseen presence as conveyed through the use of the eye camera. Like Halloween, Coraline opens with an extended sequence from the point of view of its villain, whose face we never see um, until much later in the film. Following this, we are then introduced to the eponymous protagonist, Coraline, who is shot from behind objects like trees, rocks, and from within bushes as if by a hidden presence. So again, this is very much in the slasher tradition. Similarly, this sequence from The Watcher in the Woods shows protagonist Jan being followed through the woods by a mobile unsteady camera that is representing the view of the titular watcher. And I think that because of the setting of this and the style um, of, the, of the camera, it could also be mis almost be mistaken as a sequence from Friday the 13th, which was released that same year. <laughs> 
in a 2012 retrospective of Watcher in the Woods, um, this striking resemblance to iconic slashes prompted sight and sound critic Joseph Stannard to describe the film as a slasher without any actual slashing. Both Coraline and Watcher in the Woods therefore enact the struggle for, visual contro uh, for control over the visual field that is central to Deeker and Clover's readings of the slasher. Eventually, Coraline and Jan reveal the identities of the mysterious watchers and return the gaze as represented through subjective point of view shots, as well as objective shots of these characters investigating their surroundings. In Coraline, this battle for control of the gaze is strikingly literal. Um, as many of you probably know, if you've seen it, um, the villain of the film is a demon from a parallel dimension known as Other Mother. Other Mother wants to consume Coraline's soul, and this process involves taking Coraline's eyes and replacing them with buttons, which will be sewn into place. And in order to do this, Other Mother has these long spindly fingers made of needles, which I think kind of figures her as a sort of child-friendly Freddy Krueger, but it's more to do with poking and plucking than with slashing and stabbing. So in Coraline, the protagonist has to literally protect her gaze and in turn um, turn it against her persecutor in order to survive the narrative. Through their use of the slashes, formal and structural organization around visual power, both Coraline and the Watcher in the Woods evoke unease and tension while largely avoiding violence and can therefore be read as child-friendly slashes. But then this is where my interest in the female Gothic comes into play. Because of their focus on young women or girls who are visually entrapped in domestic spaces by mysterious watchful figures, Coraline and the Watcher in the Woods can also be read as female Gothic texts just as much as slashes. The female Gothic, sometimes also known as Gothic romance, paranoid woman's film and other terms, is superficially distinct from the slasher. Female Gothic texts like Gaslight or Dragonwick usually take place in the past in a crumbling Gothic mansion, they're based on or inspired by classic Gothic literature, especially Jane Eyre or the Bluebeard fairy tale. And they are separated from the slasher by their original production context in 1940s Hollywood, where the restrictions of the code affected the degree to which they could represent violence and other taboo content. But even listing distinctions draws out similarities with the slasher. What is a gothic mansion full of secrets, if not a version of what Clover calls the slasher's terrible place? And isn't the gothic heroine described by Ellen Mowers as an explorer who encounters danger and threat, always moving, acting, reacting between the threats she encounters and her survival of them, just an ancestor of the slasher's final girl? Most importantly, for my argument, the female Gothic shares the slasher's concern with the thematic and aesthetic importance of vision. Marianne Duane describes the female Gothic as dramas of seeing organized around a phenomenon of the closed or locked door, which when opened, reveals the villain's sordid past. Like slashes then, female Gothic films are about endangered women whose survival or sanity is intimately connected to their transgressive employment of the look against their persecutor. Another quality they share is their gender politics. Both subgenres have been leveled with associations of misogyny and sadism, but each have also been defended as empowering and cathartic for female audiences. I don't have time to dig into that very thorny debate in detail, but I will say that I find Catriona Miller's description of the slasher as a particularly stark representation of what it feels like to be female within a patriarchal society resonates equally with the female gothic. This sentiment also applies to children's horror films like Coraline and Watcher in the Woods, where the protagonists are doubly marginalized as children who are also female. <laughs> 
The importance of the gaze and the theme of female entrapment are presented in female Gothic texts through mise-en-scene and framing that again draws out similarities with the slasher. Duane highlights the way that female Gothic heroines tend to be framed through windows and in doorways, which represents their entrapment. These strategies are also at work in Coraline and The Watcher in the Woods, where motifs like windows, mirrors, doors and trees cage the protagonists in claustrophobic spaces, just as the slasher-esque eye camera entraps them within a powerful gaze. And much of the time, these visual strategies are employed simultaneously. To question the distinctions between slashes and female gothic also invites us to question the distinctions between their parent categories of horror and just the gothic. These labels are often used interchangeably as a result of the fact that they both centre around evoking anxiety and fear. However, there are also arguments to be made that horror and the gothic are distinct modes. Personally, I do feel that there are subtle distinctions between these categories, but I'm also at a loss to explain what this difference is, and I haven't been satisfied with any existing scholarly attempts to do so either. And I think it generally remains kind of an impossible task. But with that being said, I do think it's interesting that some attempts to differentiate between horror and the gothic um, focus on the representation of violence as the distinguishing element. For example, Francis Cam and Tamar Jeffers MacDonald separate the gothic's foregrounding of suspicion, suspense and mystery from horror's showcasing of blood, torture and gore. Misha Kavka similarly makes the distinction based on the dialectic between seeing and not seeing. She considers the gothic as being characterised by visual restraint and codes of the liminal, like shadows and the suggestion of an unseen presence in off-screen space. By contrast, Kafka considers horror films, and interestingly, she uses slashes as her example, as presenting the monsters head on in a moment of shock and abject horror, allowing the audience the dubious comfort of screaming at what we actually see. I find this distinction based on violence and kind of how much we can see to be overly simplistic, but I think that children's horror films, as a result of the fact that they must avoid violence as a necessity of their audience of address, present a stark example of why this distinction is too simplistic. And to be clear, I'm not claiming to be doing anything especially groundbreaking by going, hmm, gothic and horror, maybe they're not so different after all. And my arguments are also not unique to children's horror cinema, as recent adult addressed films like Crimson Peak and The Invisible Man also straddle the boundary between horror, gothic and slasher, female gothic. Even early slashers like Friday the 13th borrow from the female gothic. Um, here you can see the character Brenda in the iconography of the gothic heroine with her white nightgown and a torch standing in as an equivalent for a candlestick. But while these adult examples inject the female gothic with the violence that's associated commonly with slashes, children's horror films draw out the similarities between these subgenres by instead avoiding on screen violence or by suggesting its presence in off screen space. Reading children's horror films as both slashes and female gothic texts therefore allows us to draw these generic distinctions into question in new and productive ways, while also prompting us to reconsider the boundaries between adult and children's content and the way that we define horror. In relation to definition, I want to also offer some thoughts on the importance of the labels that are used to describe children's horror and what these can reveal about hierarchies of gender, age and value in generic discourse. So I've already pointed out a number of aesthetic and narrative similarities between Coraline and Watcher in the Woods, but a key way in which they differ is how they were received upon their original release. Coraline was a modest box office success. It was very favourably received by critics and even went on to garner an Oscar nomination for Best Animated Feature. 
By contrast, The Watcher in the Woods is one of Disney's most notorious critical and commercial flops. I suggest that one reason for these differences could be in how the films were marketed, especially how closely their marketing aligned them with either horror or gothic. Even though I have suggested here that these categories are really not that different, they nevertheless carry very different connotations within popular understandings of genre. So my thoughts here are building on the ongoing critical conversation around evaluative terms like elevated horror, post-horror, etc. In his recent book on this topic, David, David Church discusses how such terms can carry a great deal of weight when it comes to preserving hierarchies of cultural value, taste and fulfilling audience expectations. So I think that we can apply this kind of thinking to the use of labels like Gothic and horror in relation to children's films. Gothic, as a label, tends to carry prestigious associations with subtlety, respectability, literary quality, high art, intellect, and when it comes to children's media, pedagogical value. Horror, meanwhile, occupies a lower rung in hierarchies of value considered to be comparatively debased, depraved, low art, and paradoxically, both immature, but also unsuitable for children. It therefore makes sense that a film studio wanting to ensure that parents feel comfortable taking children to see a frightening film would want to align such a film with the more loosely defined, respectable and restrained connotations of the gothic more than with horror. This was certainly the case in the promotional material for Coraline, which aligned the film with the Gothic by foregrounding the themes of mystery, discovery and the uncanny, despite the fact that the film does contain its fair share of jump scares and other stereotypically horrific tropes. In this way, the film takes after its predecessor, The Nightmare Before Christmas, with which it shared its director, Henry Selick. Philippa Antunis, whose book I mentioned earlier, has explained how Nightmare Before Christmas was deliberately distanced from associations with horror and was instead promoted as a gothic art film because the studio um, Disney thought that associating it with horror might damage its um, prospects. And in fact, the choice to market Nightmare and subsequently Coraline in this way can be attributed directly to the failure of The Watcher in the Woods, which was heavily promoted in line with the generic expectations of the horror film. Again, Antunis has written about this in more detail, but to be brief, The Watcher in the Woods came at a time of extreme existential crisis for the Disney studio, and it was kind of their attempt to keep up with the edgier trends of New Hollywood. And one executive even described the film as Disney's exorcist, which like is, is just completely mad. And um, you can see from the trailer here how it's trying to foreground some of those um, ideas of horror. Um, it also, um, sorry, the trailer and poster also foregrounded the film's slasher-esque stalking, screeching violins on the soundtrack, and even provided warnings that the film was edge of your seat terror and not a fairy tale. And just so that you get an idea of the tone that they were trying to, to strike, I'm just going to show you the very beginning and very end of the trailer. And I'm also doing this just because I never get bored of looking at this trailer because I think it's just one of the most bizarre things that, uh, that exists. So I'll try to share it now and hopefully this will work. Thirty years ago, something happened in these woods. Something happened in this chapel. Something no one will talk about. It's none of your business. Mr. Keller, please. Where are they? Something. Okay, I'm now just going to skip ahead to the end of that trailer um, because this is my favourite bit. Um. And Lynn Holly Johnson. 
The Watcher in the Woods from Walt Disney Productions. It is not a fairy tale. Okay. I just love that declaration. It is not for small children. And unsurprisingly, this didn't go down well with a public or a kind of critical community that held Disney as a paragon of child safe entertainment. So one does have to wonder if Watcher in the Woods might have fared slightly better if the studio had taken a different approach in the marketing of the film and tried to position it instead more in line with ideas around the gothic and mystery, a concept that might sit more comfortably with the idea of the Disney brand. And as I hope I've demonstrated here, the difference between horror and gothic is indefinably murky, but these categories and their associations can nevertheless convey very different meanings to a film going public, especially when it comes to their perceived suitability for audiences. To take this one step further, the fact that Coraline and The Watcher in the Woods are both films about girls also raises questions about the gendered connotations of horror and the gothic. Gothic is more typically considered a feminine genre um, compared with assumptions about horror being masculinized and misogynistic. And indeed, Mark Jankovic has discussed the way that terminology and gender have functioned in generic gatekeeping, citing the 1940s female gothic cycle as a subgenre that has been left out of histories of horror, despite its obvious kinship with um, other horrific traditions. And more recently, we've seen similar attempts at gatekeeping around feminized or youth horror texts like Twilight. So to draw to a close, Children and women are two marginalized groups who have been worried about by paternalistic forces when it comes to the supposed damaging effects that horror could have on them. When it comes to female centric children's horror films, then perhaps their paratextual distancing from horror in favor of alignment with the Gothic helps to assure worried adults that such films are not only child friendly, but especially girl friendly. Although if, this assumption is correct, I would argue that such a distinction does a great disservice to children's horror films and the children who watch them, girls and otherwise. That's it, thank you. That's great, thank you very much Catherine for an absolutely fascinating paper and lots of really lively discussion in the chat as well about that presentation. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Um, Thea Ray Bamber, who is going to talk about um, the rise of, or sorry, behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon and the slasher um, and the final girl as romantic heroes. And Thea Ray is a PhD student with Roehampton University, currently working on their PhD thesis on the representation of goth and goth subcultures in contemporary horror. Their main research interests include the use of homoerotic imagery and narrative in slasher and splasher horror cinema, and the ways in which marginalized audiences interact with horror fandom. Outside of academia, they self-publish their work through the means of online video essays, which they produce independently as a means of making their level of academia accessible and entertaining. And they've said at the end here that they are fully aware of how <laughs> shameless that promotion was, but that's fine. I'm kind of interested in hearing about it. Um, so welcome and thank you. I'm really excited to hear this because I think Leslie Vernon is such an underrated film. So um, I'll hand over. <laughs> thank you, Miranda, for that marvellous introduction. So uh, just give me a second while I find this presentation. There we go. OK, <clears throat> so once again, <laughs> hi there. So considering this is my first conference paper Ever, I thought I'd start with something I know plenty about, bad men and why I specifically like them. So today I will be examining Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon and its representation of a romantic narrative amidst its metatextual slasher narrative, not only to analyse the subtextual romance between its titular slasher and final girl, but also to examine how it replicates the romantic tropes established by the cano canonical gothic text which preceded it. So, first of all, 
Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon is set in a world where slasher villains are real, and the film follows student journalist Taylor Gentry and her crew as they document an aspiring serial killer, the titular Leslie Vernon. As a killer, Leslie idolizes these slashers and models himself according to slasher film conventions. Kind of half true crime junkie and half horror fan. <laughs> Operating as a mockumentary just dripping with black comedy and self-referential humour, Behind the Mask is a loving homage to the entire slasher genre and earned generally positive reviews as a result. So, firstly, before we get into the slashers, let's get into where they started and the subject of this panel. Gothic literature is a genre of fiction that largely covers themes of horror, death, and occasionally romance. Said to derive originally from Horace Walpole's 1764 novel, The Castle of Otranto, Gothic literature often focused on the supernatural and monstrous while also focusing predominantly on the everyday lives of their protagonists and their typically predestined stories and unfortunate fates. So, Edmund Burke theorised that the Gothic emotional aesthetic must invoke the sublime, terror and the obscurity. To paraphrase Burke, the sublime is that which is or produces the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. The sublime is most often evoked by terror, and to cause terror, we need some amount of obscurity. We can't know everything about that which is inducing terror, or else a great deal of apprehension vanishes. Obscurity is necessary in order to experience the terror of the unknown. From this, we can infer the feelings of the sublime, terror and obscurity became essential to what would inform the gothic that we know today, and subsequently what would inform the future of cinematic horror. Petridus argues that though cinematic horror is largely inspired by gothic literature, slasher films rarely honour these gothic influences, as the action is placed in familiar landscapes. But I would argue that much of what we know about the slasher genre is largely informed by the generic tropes of the gothic. For example, the past coming back to haunt you, the danger of the pastoral natural setting, never being able to rid yourself of the sins of previous generations. I would say if a work can inspire the same sublime terror and obscurity that we associate with the gothic, I would say that it effectively operates at the same heights of horror that the gothic was known for. I would even go as far as to argue, much like Catherine Lester said in her previous uh, presentation, that the archetypal gothic heroine would go forward to inspire the final girl, particularly when it's often the young virginal woman who succeeds in the end. So speaking of the final girl, already Behind the Mask deals with and in fact discusses a great deal of horror theory. For one, it interacts closely with horror history, using using playful metatextual and self-referential humour to aid its deconstruction of slasher tropes. These references are not only included as a playful nod to the audience, but it is also intrinsically involved with the film's plot, demonstrated similarly in 1992's Man Bites Dog. What these films have in common is not only the inward reflection they have about their respective genres, but also the consistent questions about the values of authorship and just how far someone can go for the sake of their work. Additionally, and demonstrated in the film when Leslie tells Taylor about his plans of Flash of Stardom, he places intense importance on the survivor girl and her role in his becoming, referencing the final girl horror theory popularised by Carol J. Clover, with the original screenplay even citing Clover by name. The film posits, as many feminist horror critics have argued before, that the final girl is integral to the slasher movie format and that a true slasher narrative cannot function without her. It is she who is the most important character in the narrative, with everything the slasher villain doing being in service of her growth as a horror heroine, at least in the metaphorical sense. Different from its predecessors though, Behind the Mask makes this reading inarguable, with Leslie even reiterating in the text that his entire future as a slasher villain hinges on his own survivor girl's strength and capability. So here is our final girl. Taylor is an especially interesting final girl because it is, is, it is her own interest, her passion for her work, and perhaps her morbid fascination that drives her, 
She chooses to seek Leslie out. She chooses to participate in her plan. She chooses to stay when he inevitably proves that he's dangerous, not just to his victims, but maybe to her too. It is Leslie who invites her into his world, and it is Taylor who accepts that invitation, watching and occasionally outright participating in his plans despite her claims of objectivity. As written on the quote on screen, Taylor represents a very particular element of the horror fan base. She is the female horror fan academic. Through Taylor, though, Behind the Mask poses some interesting questions about authorship and just how much we can author our own stories before someone else steps in. To just expand on these questions of authorship a little more, Savannah Teague raises the interesting idea of the film having three distinct lenses with which it, with which it views the story. The camera lens, top left, or the diegetic material being recorded on camera that is controlled by Taylor, the slasher lens, top right, Leslie's skewed vision of his plans, and the true lens, bottom center, the events that are actually happening in the film, which are essentially Taylor's point of view, a vision on her world that she can't control. Taylor is a documentarian. That is the first thing established in the film. And although she is not the camera operator, she is the one directing the shots. It's not at all coincidental that this true lens is only used when Taylor has been left in the dark. Ergo, why it's most significantly used in the final act of the film when Leslie re-enters the house to fulfill his killing spree and Taylor has to go back in to stop him. Though this change was criticised by audiences, I think it's a really interesting cinematic representation of Taylor as a character, in so much that it is only true because it is, a, it is a depiction of her limited knowledge and her inability to author the story in a way she wants. In the finale of the film, as murder after murder unfolds and every one of Leslie's plans comes to action, Taylor realises that she has been Leslie's final girl the entire time. Having believed herself to be the author, the director, until the very last moment, the reveal of Taylor as the intended final girl not only invokes the sublime terror and obscurity as mentioned earlier, but it also strengthens the connection that Taylor has with Leslie. Because when Taylor is in control of her gaze, its focus is on a handsome young man rather than a vulnerable woman. Speaking of, let's talk about him. Leslie Vernon is the film's titular slasher, living in a world where slasher villains are real people with very real body counts. As we learn more about Leslie through the film, we experience the same struggle that Taylor has. She is torn between how to perceive Vernon. With the mask, he is a monster, but behind the mask, he is a likeable and gregarious goofball who keeps two pet turtles. It certainly also helps that Leslie is a pretty good looking guy. He's well read and talks excitedly about philosophy and literary theory, and he examines himself, his plans and his motivations in a very nuanced and insightful way. If I'm going to argue that Taylor is the female horror academic, the conclusion that Leslie is an academic in his own right, and that Taylor is Leslie's text, and they're both grappling with a similar fascination and kind of attraction to each other, is a pretty accurate one to make. Similarly, and much like Taylor's active choice to pursue him, Leslie is choosing his fate. As written on this screen, once Leslie begins his killing spree, he cannot stop it, even if Taylor begs him to, because he is the predestined evil to her good. Both of their choices relate them to the Gothic's propensity for predestined stories and unfortunate fates. An apt comparison to the dynamic I'm discussing in this paper and my personal favourite of the gothic literature canon, because of course it is, is Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. The book concerns two wealthy families living on the West Yorkshire Moors, the Earnshaws and the Lintons, and their turbulent relationships with the Earnshaws' adopted son, Heathcliff. In literature, the term gothic double refers to a polar duality of good and evil within a single character. But Daphne writes that the romantic double, citing Kathy Earnshaw and Heathcliff as examples, operates in a very similar way, with one person as good capable of evil and the other as evil capable of good. The romantic double as represented through the gothic are intrinsically connected to each other in a unity of damning love and passion. 
and love as depicted through the gothic gothic is equated to the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling as capable of evoking sublime terror and obscurity as any horror can in a scene when nelly wuthering heights as main narrator asks why she wouldn't wed heathcliff kathy responds he's more myself than i am whatever our souls are made of his and mine are the same this scene essentially confirms that Heathcliff and Kathy are obsessed with each other. They are two sides of the same person. Person, And even if Kathy knows that a relationship with Heathcliff would be doomed from the start, her obsession never wanes, seemingly even in death, much like the slasher and the survivor girl. I'd say that it's not at all coincidental that slashers and final girls often have relationships of some kind. Billy Loomis, one half of the original Ghostface, was Sydney's boyfriend. Michael Myers doggedly stalks Laurie Strode, who is often read as his sister. And Freddy Krueger becomes so obsessed with Nancy Thompson that he stalks her actress, Heather Langenkamp, in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. To push this concept even further, Candyman, originally written by Clive Barker, a director and writer well known for blending horror, romance and eroticism in his work, very directly depicts a gothic horror romance about a mythological killer seeking a companion to add to the legend that keeps him alive. As a contemporary text, Candyman flourishes as a true example of a gothic love story with profound violence at its heart, as capable of evoking the sublime, terror and obscurity as any canonical classic. The romantic slasher directly suggests that the slasher and the survivor girl are uniquely connected, that they are two sides of the same person, much like Kathy and Heathcliff. Unlike them though, they bring out the best in each other, even if it's through grotesque means, and they both help the other to realize their true potential, with the slasher going down in notoriety and the survivor girl a woman reborn. In terms of relationships, even if the dynamic is toxic or problematic, nobody else understands the slasher like the survivor girl and vice versa. Hence, whatever his, our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. Behind the Mask even depicts this very concept through the characters of Eugene and Jamie, Leslie's mentors and close friends. Eugene was a slasher who worked in the 70s, intended to be read as Billy or the Mona from Black Christmas, but is now retired and living a quiet life with his wife, Jamie, his survivor girl. Demonstrated in the quote on screen, Leslie describes them on, as a bridge of past and future. And on the surface, one might read that comment as being referential to just himself and Eugene, the slashers. But if we consider the already established connection between Taylor and Leslie, the bridge between Eugene and Jamie as past and Leslie and Taylor as future becomes a lot more textual and a lot more romantic. Now, like any academic, I like subtext, but I think a nice bit of Dom text is needed here too. Throughout the film, Leslie frequently invites Taylor to participate in the slasher movie process, which she does without hesitation, letting her fascination overtake her rationale to stay objective and inadvertently participating in her own fate. And when they play out successfully, he asks if it's okay to hug her, to which she consents. From there, and once that initial contact is formed, he touches and hugs her quite frequently. And when he pulls away, she always seems to be smiling. Their chemistry comes to a head in a scene before, just before Leslie is about to realise his plans. He sits alone with Taylor in comfortable silence and quietly says that he's so happy. When he starts to sob, Taylor holds his hand and the camera lingers on that silent means for her to comfort him, as shown on the bottom right. I can't help but feel that the attention paid to this scene is significant in how the film is trying to frame their relationship. After all, the act of handholding is one so simple, yet one dripping with romantic meaning and importance, that people write poems, essays and songs about the yearning to just hold someone's hand and feel held by them in turn. Even turning our attention back to horror study, Midsummer posits the important question. Do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? But, of course, like any other slasher or final girl, or truly any gothic romantic pairing, Taylor and Leslie are doomed from the start. But, even as Taylor is about to kill him, 
Interestingly, not with a knife, pitchfork, or a sword, the generic phallic metaphors of the slasher genre, but with an apple press, weaponizing a symbol of fertility and original sin in Christian dogma and reclaiming it, after he's slain a plethora of innocent people, including one of her crew members, there's just a moment of hesitation from her, long enough for Leslie to remove his mask. This is framed as a deeply intimate act and separated from the slasher persona that he constructed for himself and finally under the true gaze, Taylor's gaze, he mutters his last words. You, you're the one. Before Taylor supposedly kills him and sets fire to the tool shed where they fought. When she stumbles out, she is exactly what she and Leslie said she would be, a woman reborn and hell bent on revenge. And because this is a horror movie, if you stick around long enough after the credits roll, we see that Leslie himself is reborn too. Finally, the slasher legend that he dreamed of being and sure to terrorize generations after him. Much like Candyman, Taylor is what keeps Leslie's name alive. It is her companionship that pushes him into the ranks of slasher stardom. So in conclusion, Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon successfully follows a long line of slashes before it in its use of metatextuality and self-referential humour, placing Leslie himself on the same level as the greats. Not only that, its use of a romantic subtext amidst its horror narrative successfully replicates the same gothic tropes that the horror genre was built off of and associates it with a writerly history often deemed as canonical and valuable in academic circles. Thank you. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much. That was absolutely fabulous. And thank you to <laughs> both of our presenters for two really wonderful papers. Uh, so um, I guess we probably have somewhere in the region of about 20 minutes for questions. So um, I'll be taking questions from the comments on YouTube. I've already picked out a few from earlier uh, in the panel. So because they came from earlier in the panel, they're aimed primarily at Catherine. So what I might do is I'll go through some of those first, and that will give you time to maybe think up of some more questions for our second presenter or maybe questions aimed at both presenters. So sorry, I've been copying and pasting them into a document, so I have all of them. Uh, OK, so to begin with, uh, one of the first questions I received was from Susan Vanderbeek. And Susan asks or comments, the notion of the slasher as a struggle for visual control is very interesting. In children's culture, uh, I immediately think of the ways in which adults constantly observe children to make sure they behave or that they're safe. Is this kind of visual control also used in children's horror movies? Um, it's a really good question. And I think the interesting thing about children's horror movies, or at least the most transgressive and interesting children's horror movies, is that they are almost always about children who are free from adult supervision. Um, because of course, if they were under adult supervision, they probably wouldn't get into the sort of the things that they get into, you know, like Monster House is a really good example of one that's like that, the Monster Squad, um, all of those kinds of films that are in the kind of Amblin tradition as well. Um, adults would not believe them or just kind of shut everything down if they were present. So adults kind of have to be absent as, um, in order for children's horror films to to happen, in order for them to take place. Um, I, I also want to kind of jump ahead because I saw that Steve um, had yeah, also kind of, that off well, yeah, so pinged off of that you. one um, to ask about whether the opposite is true, that children gain power by spying on adult situations. And I think, yes, absolutely. Um, as a virtue of the fact that adults are kind of at the periphery of these narratives, that allows the child characters to um yeah essentially spy on on the adult world maybe not literally but um these but children's horror alone um as a concept it is about children having access to something that we usually define as being an adult genre um the children in these films um kind of access the adult world through their encounters with the horrific they often diegetically watch horror films within the narratives um, and sometimes they do literally kind of spy on the adult world and um, the, the film The Monster Squad is an interesting one with like 
examples of that kind of scattered throughout where um, the children will be kind of privy to information or situations um, sometimes involving adults and their own parents uh, while the adults themselves are kind of completely oblivious so yeah I definitely think it's it's more in line with with what you're saying Steve where it's kind of flipped over but yes the idea of visual hierarchy is definitely really central in all children's horror films I think but especially obviously in the ones I talked about that's really interesting. Thank you for that response. I should say also the next panel is at um, 10 past one. So I was a little bit over enthusiastic with the 20 minutes for questions. Um, so um, I'm going to take another question um, from the chat that appeared earlier today. And this one is also for Catherine. It's from Vincent Gain. And Vincent says, the sanitizing of violence seems like a standard trope in family cinema, such as the lack of blood in James Bond or Marvel films. Is the spectacle of the eye camera that makes these films, is it the spectacle of the eye camera that makes these films distinctive rather than the more grand scale visual displays of these blockbusters, less the visual spectacle and more the spectacle of the visualizing? Um, that is a really interesting suggestion. It's not something that I think I've, I've, given a great deal of thought to you know like how the children's horror films kind of compare with those bigger mass audience blockbusters but um I think that that's something I would like to mull over perhaps but because it's not something I'd really thought about but thank you okay uh so we have another question this one comes from the dread laboratories and it is for Thea and the question asks, what would you say found footage as a formal or structural subgenre brings to a movie that is traditionally shot in, in a kind of conventional manner? Yeah, so, so in the context of um, Behind the Mask, at least, it definitely, what it brings to it is that it specifically tailors gaze. It's a gaze that's motivated by one person. And I think that's kind of the case with a lot of found footage that it's diegetically um, motivated by a singular person, where, whereas like in traditional cinema, it's it's not diegetically motivated by anything. So I would say that in like any context of uh, found footage or like any perspective of a singular person, it's more so diegetically motivated by them. So like I said, in the context of Behind the Mask, it is Taylor's gaze, it's what she's controlling. So I think that's probably what I would say about found footage is that it's controlled by one person. It's not controlled non-diegetically, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's a really good and a very thoughtful response. Um, okay, so we have two minutes left and I'm just going to go back to one of the earlier questions. And I think this is from Vincent again. Horror is both immature and unsuitable for children. How do we understand this paradox? Is it bound up with other prejudices? It is a paradox, but I think um, I think in the in the question they asked, they they also asked if it was to do with um, kind of hierarchies of like race and class mm -hmm. and gender. Um, I definitely feel like the 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 class and racial politics is something that I want to dig into a bit more um, in future research. Um, but I think that those those accusations of horror being both immature and unsuitable for children at the same time are not necessarily always coming from the same groups. So kind of horror fans sometimes, this is something that Philip, Philippa Antunis talks about in her book actually, how um, there have been specific times in um, the history of the genre where fans have deliberately tried to distance horror from the idea of childishness in order to um, kind of mark it as kind of prestigious and respectful and, and worthy, but also to be like, no, like children stay away, this isn't for you, like you're not, you're not allowed in this like club, right? Whereas um, those accusations of unsuitability for children tend to be coming more from a place of worry from um, people who are usually not horror fans, really. Um, so it is a paradox, but I think usually coming from slightly different places. 
Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so it is now 10 past one. So I'm going to finish there. Um, and uh, once again, I just wanted to thank both of our presenters for two really fascinating papers. So thank you both so much. It was really, really interesting to listen to both of you. I, thank you very much, Miranda, for chairing the uh, the panel. You did a, a brilliant job. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you, Kat and Thea, for excellent and, and fascinating papers.